you know, growing up in the church, um, I'm used to singing so many different Christmas songs. And uh, I remember as a kid, you know, I was used to songs like Joy to the World where... happier songs because after all it's Christmas and we're all wanting to be joyful it's the birth of Christ and so you know not being really theologically astute as a kid either I all I knew from my ear was that there was a difference between joy of the world that was starting with celebration and then this O Come O Come Emmanuel minor key and I thought to myself it's like that old uh, Sesame Street thing which of these things is not like the other it it didn't seem to fit until years later you know as I started looking at the words and I thought you know, first of all what Emmanuel you, you hear Jesus called Emmanuel so many times but it took me you know years later even through seminary and learning Hebrew before I finally understood Oh, Emmanuel means God with us. Okay, that means a little bit more. So come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Well, what, what's that all about? Well, you know, going through the history of the Old Testament and the history of Israel and beginning to understand that it was part of Israel's story that they were constantly in exile. And the beautiful thing about this song to me is that it, it's... It's talking about that that um, captivity and the exile and just a mournful tone in the music until you get to that refrain where they talk about rejoice. It goes really major again and then it goes back again. You know, I've just grown to love this song because of that, because I, I think um, there's such a picture there, um, musically, of what it's all about, this longing. O come thou rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny, from depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory o'er the grave. Because, let's face it, I mean, as a kid, growing up, I'm thinking, you know, captivity, exile, <laughs> morning none of these words are making much sense to me and especially in the west in the united states there's not real really this idea of being held captive or captivity but that verse kind of makes it a little bit more personal because we realize that beyond the picture of israel being in captivity um, physically um, there's a captivity that we experience um, to satan because of sin this hope that we experience at Christmas time, um, this this forward looking and anticipating of Emmanuel, God with us, having come once already, experiencing that second coming, um, and knowing that um, that yeah, there is a captivity that I experience. I am in exile, but it's going to be uh, completely vanquished one day um, when Jesus returns again. You ever come to a place in your life where you felt hopeless and where you just didn't want to go on? And maybe you had put a lot of expectations into something or someone and it all kind of dashed before you. Maybe it was a job or maybe it was not getting into a school. Maybe somebody disappointed you or let you down. Maybe it was a diagnosis. Maybe you lost someone. When we come to that place of darkness in our lives and we start giving up hope, it's really hard to get it back again. Sometimes we try to do it ourselves. We go into ourselves and we say, I can do this. And we try to muster up all the energy and strength we can. And it might work for a while, but it'll eventually just kind of fade. Where do we go for hope? 
You know, Jen mentioned it earlier in the announcements. This time of year, while it's celebratory and while many people are joyful during this time of year, it, it can be a, a difficult time for people as well. Uh, speaking personally, for me, it's a bittersweet time of the year. You know, I look around and, and I see everyone joyful. I, I look at my kids and I, I see the celebration. I love putting up Christmas decorations. I start listening to Christmas music back in July, probably before any of you even think about it. Um, and it's awesome. But at the same time, every time that I come to a family gathering, I look at empty seats and I think, man, my parents should have been there. You know, they moved an hour away from me and boy, I wish that they had been there. And I look, and honestly, it's hard sometimes, and I see around as I go to family gatherings and people enjoying their families and their parents, and I think, this stinks. It's rough. But I always have to remind myself, when I get to that place of hopelessness, when I get discouraged and when it feels dark to me, that the light comes outside of me. It's not in me (laughs) that I muster this up. And I'm not the only one who's ever experienced darkness before. Even when I think about my own darkness, the darkness that I experience, doesn't, it pales in comparison to other people. I mean, again, what Jen mentioned, that, that we have so much. And there are so many people who are living hand to mouth every day. And it becomes dark. And people want to give up hope. People get discouraged You know, hope, what is it? Viktor Frankl, who was uh, a concentration camp and Holocaust survivor and author, he said this, any attempt to restore a man's inner strength in the concentration camp had first to succeed in showing him some future goal. And then he goes on and he quotes Nietzsche, which if you have any knowledge of Nietzsche is ironic in and of itself. But he says, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. We get our hope by having something to live for, by understanding the why of it, and then we can do anyhow. South African Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was very instrumental in the country's move away from apartheid and move um, more to the freedom that they're experiencing now, he said this, hope is being able to see that there's light despite all the darkness. Tertullian, one of the church fathers Uh, who was instrumental in in helping um, to give thought to the rise of of the Christian church. He said, hope is patience with the lamp lit. And then finally, the Russian author, Fyodor Dostoevsky, said, to live without hope is to cease to live. Hope, where do we find it? What happens when we get to that place of darkness, when we're just longing for hope again? We're not the only ones who've experienced this before. In fact, we have a whole book full of people who have experienced hopelessness, and yet they found their hope somewhere. The people of God are a great example of people who had lost hope. If we track through the, the history of Israel we see that early on in Genesis, God had made a promise to them and had called them out from among the other nations. But then they find themselves in captivity, in bondage, in slavery in Egypt. And God rescues them and brings them to this promised land. And then they disobey the Lord and they're pulled out of that promised land and brought into exile in Babylon. And the darkness overcomes them again. And then they're told, you will come back and and be brought out of exile back to this promised land. And they do that. And then the Roman Empire comes in and takes control over them. And the story goes on and on. And we see bondage and oppression and slavery and darkness and hopelessness. And in the midst of that darkness... God speaks to them, and he eventually comes. First, he promises that he's going to come. In in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the promise is given that Emmanuel, God with us, will come. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The The virgin will conceive and 
give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then just a few chapters later, in chapter 9 of Isaiah, we read these words, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Imagine the Israelites hearing those words in the midst of their darkness. He's speaking to us. And they've seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And they probably thought to themselves, finally, we can have hope again. And Isaiah continues on in that chapter. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And it continues on in verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He'll reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. In verse 8, the Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say with pride and arrogance of heart. The rest of the verse. And the people of Israel were told that darkness, in the midst of that darkness, light was going to come. And it was going to come in the form of Emmanuel, God with us. But the people of Israel were probably very similar to us in that when we know that hope is coming, when we're expecting it, when we're anticipating it, we make a picture in our mind of what it's going to look like. And then when it comes along and it doesn't look like what we thought it was going to look like, we get mad or we get upset. Or even as we see in, among the Israelites that they deny that that's even the answer. That in the midst of darkness, when light comes, it doesn't always look the way we think it's going to look. And there's a man that we're going to look at this morning named Zechariah who sees that and who understands that. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 68. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist who was told that he was going to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And Zechariah was rendered speechless, literally, until he finally named his son John, and then he was able to speak. And this is the first thing that he says after his mouth is opened and he can speak again. He says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors, to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And here we see a picture from Zechariah of where it is that he found hope. Imagine feeling like God was silent for hundreds of years, knowing that there was a promise there, and then God speaks. And Zechariah responds here, and he sees, first of all, and he finds his hope in salvation in the here and now. God promises salvation in two ways. He promises a long-term salvation, an eternal salvation, but he also promises the here and now salvation. But it doesn't always look the way that we think it will. But in his prayer here, Zechariah says that God has raised up a horn of salvation. In verse 71, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. When we find ourselves in darkness, when we find ourselves in a place of hopelessness, there's an imminent need for salvation. We want it to happen, and we want it to happen right now. We want to get out of it. And so we're going to look anywhere possible. One of my biggest problems is my impatience. And when I'm waiting for an answer, when I'm expecting an answer, when I'm looking for hope, I can easily go to the wrong place. 
I can easily look in all the wrong places to find that hope that's been promised because I'm too impatient. But in the midst of that darkness, we cry out, save us now. Hosanna, the cry of the Israelites, save us. And then we wait And God says, I will save you, not only long term, but I will save you here. I will save you now. I will save you from your enemies. I will save you from those who hate you. This is the message that we want to hear. It's the message that we want to hear when we're in darkness because it's a message of hope. It's a message of light. Alec Meyer, the the commentator, in, in his commentary on Isaiah, he says this, Beyond the darkness of the hidden face, the hidden face of God, and the distressful pathway, there is the shining light. Sometimes it almost seems like it's just without reach, out of reach. We can't quite put our, our, our hand on it, but it's there. And we need to remember that there is hope in salvation. But there's also hope in God's covenant promise. Our God is a God of covenants. And as we look through the Old Testament and we see the promises that God made with his people, starting in in Genesis, we see he makes a covenant with Adam and Eve, and then he makes a covenant to Abram, later Abraham. He makes a covenant with Moses and with, with Noah and with Moses and makes a covenant with David. And there's a promise And in our day and age where what we say and what we do don't always mix, we always have to not let that cloud how we hear the covenant promises of our God. That God's word spoken to us is true. Whether the words of other people around us are true or not, we need to trust that when God makes a promise, a covenant promise to us, that he is faithful in that promise and he is true to that. The prophets over and over throughout the years, they spoke of one who was to come. Isaiah especially, we read that earlier, and we see all through Isaiah these hints, these promises of what is to come. And Zechariah found his hope in the fact that God had made promises and he knew that God was faithful and he could find hope in the faithfulness of God in and through those promises that he'd made over and over and over again. And then finally, in verses 74 and 75, Zechariah says to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. You know, imagine what that was like to speak those words from Zechariah. Having understood what it was like to have seen the history of his people being in bondage, being in slavery, being in exile, and wondering, when, Lord, when will you save us? And finally coming to the place where he can utter those words that you have come to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and that we will be enabled to serve without fear. You see, hope and fear cannot coexist together. Fear will overtake hope. Fear is in the darkness. And so when we start experiencing fear, then we'll start losing hope. And our hope is gone. But we also have to remember and find our hope in the fact that the salvation that comes to us, the covenant promises that come to us, and God's provision that comes to us, it's not for us. It's for others, and it's for him. It says that, Zechariah says, that we can worship in fear, or without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. That's why we are freed. That's why we are given hope. 
We're given hope so that we can turn it around. And all of our days in holiness and in righteousness, we can serve before the Lord. We find our hope in knowing that he has freed us for a purpose. He has freed us in order that we can live in holiness and righteousness before him for his namesake. It doesn't mean we just all gather around, we sing Kumbaya or Amazing Grace, and then we go home. Because part of serving him in righteousness and holiness is that we serve others. And we show people Jesus. Because let's face it, it's hard to find hope today. And people are looking everywhere other than where they should be. And there's darkness everywhere. And it's really hard to find hope. But you see, hope comes not by God providing an immediate fix from far away. It comes from God entering into time and space. He becomes a man. He becomes a living hope for all who follow him. And hope isn't always immediately fulfilled. The imminence that we feel and expect, the urgency that we feel within of that oncoming hope, it doesn't always happen. It's not microwave hope. Finally got that, huh? <clears throat> It's not immediately fulfilled, but it's sparked. And it's set on fire. It's ignited in order that it might burn. And that's what hope does within us. It burns within us. And when we understand that Emmanuel, God with us, has come, has ignited that flame of hope within us, then, then we're ready to enter into the Advent season. Because we cannot experience love and joy and peace until we finally experienced hope. We will not be able to experience the best that Advent has to offer until we experience hope first. Until we understand who this Emmanuel, God with us is. And so the question is, will we open our hearts to that hope so that we can also experience that love, the joy, the peace that only God will bring us through Jesus Christ? Will we experience Advent to the fullest because we've found our hope in the only place that is foolproof, the only place that is rock solid, the only place that won't let us down? Question, as we continue in our time going to the table of the Lord, remembering <laughs> that we cannot have Christmas without Easter. That we cannot think of this cute little baby in a manger without also thinking about a man on a cross. And that we need to remember that both the manger and the cross give us hope. Those are the places where we find our hope. And so my question to you this morning, as you enter into the Advent season, where are you looking for hope? Where is it that you're trying to find hope? You might also ask yourself, where have I tried and failed to find hope? But also, what would it take for you to find real hope this Advent season? You know, I know that m many of us are coming from all different places this morning. Some of us have been known this hope for a long time, and some of us might just be exploring it and wondering, is it real? I I'm not under the assumption either that just because we've known who Jesus is for our entire lives that we don't experience darkness and that we don't need light, because I think we do. And so the question is, are we going to open ourselves up regardless of where we are on that journey to hope so that we can experience the love, joy, and peace of Christ as well? And the only way we can answer this third question is if we experience hope 
We can't give hope to other people if we've not experienced it ourselves. And so the question is, how can you share the hope of Christ with one other person this week, this season? It doesn't just have to be one, but start there. But find hope first. And in finding hope, you'll find the love, the joy, and the peace, and then you'll be able to share it. Share it with others so that they too might know the hope of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the hope that you have brought us, the hope that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Remind us of that hope. And Father, may we start there. May that be the point from which we jump into Advent. Remind us when we continue to look in the wrong places for hope that you alone are the hope and the light of the world. In Christ's name, amen.